wait a beat and say hello. G'day folks, it's me, Greg, we're back. It's Friday, it's time to learn at lunch. That's because it's lunch and learn time. We are still working on this pretty complicated, but also fun uh, budget and forecasting solution for Fabric. Um, I've got this whole big grand complicated plan uh, about getting budgeting data. We're going to consolidate the budget. We're going to do a forecast. We're going to take the forecast. We're going to do some more cool stuff. We're going to drag all of that in, and then we're going to create some cool, really cool visualizations. I can't wait till we get to do the actual Power BI bit. That's the bit I'm good at. But we've got a lot of work to do before then, and um, uh, and it's really about understanding our process, uh, adjusting our process so that things work properly. And then also so that people have the opportunity to fix things along the way. Um, and and I, I see this more and more, and I wrote a LinkedIn post about it this morning, about, about how as, as reporting people, as data analysts or as Power BI people, we're more and more required to build the full end-to-end -end process, you know? And I talk about the, the, the insight. Do I have a written it here somewhere? Insight to entry to insight process. Here it is. I knew I'd written it somewhere from entry to insight. I'm going to talk about this a lot because I don't think enough people talk about it. You enter data on one end and then the insights come out the other end. Um, but it's not linear and it's not simple. It's complicated and it's horrible. And there's people involved and people are weird and they ask you to do weird things and they ask you weird questions. And so we need to account for all of those things. And so I'm trying to recreate that a little bit in this kind of budget and forecasting process that we're building. And I've had to completely, I haven't not completely redesigning the, the process, but I've had to adjust. And this is based on me kind of messing around during the week with the um, with the Excel templates and trying to figure it all out. And then when it's all finalized and we've actually figured this out and all the templates are ready and all the rest of it, then I'll put it in a GitHub and then you can download it. And I'm going to put it in a GitHub and I'm going to make you learn how to use Git to get it because Git's cool. And you should learn it. Even if you're an accounting nerd, you should still learn it. All right. Uh, Richard's new. He's certified in fabric and stuff. Cool. Welcome, Richard. Nice one. Um, all right. What are we doing first? Well, first, we're going to open Power BI and we're going to see this. Dun, dun, dun. Again, my fabric trial is going to expire in three days, but now they've added something. They add this. This is new. It says, I understand that I risk permanent data loss if I don't move my awesome fabric uh, workspace. And I also learned how to do arrows during the break, which is cool. And then they don't have an OK button. They have a buy fabric button. So that's nice. So I guess a lot of people are going to be buying fabric in the next little while. Um, if you're wondering to yourself and you're new and you're like, how I don't know which fabric to buy, then you should go and look at my website and look at my video where I rant about how to figure out uh, using the thing is, and we'll put a link to that. I'll I'll find the uh, let me just I'm just gonna quickly uh, just quickly find the link to fabric the fabric video. I've got it right here. Won't take a second. Here's the website. There's me. I apologize also for those of you on LinkedIn that my face appears so often on LinkedIn. It's just, it's, it's, I promise it's not me. It's my marketing because she loves putting my face on everything. And I don't know. So sorry about that. Uh, cool. All right. Um, there is the link. If you want to learn about your fabric trial, and many of you, have, we've already spoken about this many times, so I won't bore you with it, but our fabric trial is expiring. We acknowledge it that we're going to lose our data. There's FabCons happening in Stockholm, Sweden, if you're interested in going. Wouldn't that be cool? I'd love to go. I, uh, one, uh, I'm i going to start like applying to speak at these things so that I can go to Sweden. But I can't go this year because I'm poor. Uh, and I already went overseas. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Here we are. We're in our uh, finance dev. We work for Aardvark, Aardvark Consulting. Aardvark. Uh, Aardvark. I don't know what we do. What do we do? We sell widgets. We're widget selling Aardvark widget production company. Um, we've created some bits and pieces. These are all happened. This all happened in the previous episodes. We've got a really beautiful uh, task flow here that tells us what we're doing. This is a diagram of what's supposed to be happening. And I have to change it because I think we need to change what we're doing. But let's run through it really quickly. I know you've all seen this if you've been hanging doing this um, 
uh, been coming along for a while, but I will run through it. So I've got all these various departments. Each department has to create their own budget. They're going to create it in Excel. Why Excel? Because Excel is awesome. Why wouldn't you use Excel? Don't worry about Anaplan or SAP or any of these enterprise systems that actually do the work. Just do it in Excel. That's my advice to you. <laughs> uh, um, once they get the budget, then we have to consolidate the budget, right? So there's actually a step before this that I haven't spoken about which is why I wanted to change it. I don't know if I'll change the task flow. Maybe I'll just draw the picture. And that is, here's our consolidated budget. So this is what we're talking about. There's the four things, then we consolidate the budget. Then we're going to do a forecast. Then we're going to create, calculate the EBITDA and all these cool KPIs. And then we're going to bring all of that in. We're going to talk about currency conversion. Uh, we're not going to talk about currency conversion. Um, that's our bronze layer. Can I make this a different color? Maybe I can make it a here we go bronze layer bronze and then this is our silver layer yeah silver it's not very silvery so if we make it more silvery is that going to be too silvery oh no perfect perfect silvery and then we have a gold layer this is a bit too yellow it's not then this is more yellow than gold that's too orange okay we'll go yellow this is our gold layer the gold standard. Um, if you're not familiar with medallion architectures, which is what we're talking about with bronze, silver, gold, then I talk about that at some point as well. But don't worry. I know it's complicated. It's a complicated process. We know this. We know this, but we have to change it. What do we have to change? The first thing is to get the data into these spreadsheets, we actually have to take data out of our ERP system. ERP system. And the ERP we use exports data as CSV files because we're not very original. And we don't have sophisticated SQL uh, access to our ERP. It's a cloud, let's say, let's pretend it's a cloud ERP and we can only get Excel files out of it or CSV files out of it. I don't know, but it's something like that. So that means in our little lake housey business here in one uh one lake uh we have this folder here it's called erp extracts and look it's got csv files in it I've, I've shown you this before okay so the first step is data comes out of our x out of our erp system however you get it you know we want to put that into fabric and store it out of our erp system that's our raw erp extracts then we're going to take that data out of fabric and we're going to put it into our Excel files. Then we're going to, and each department's going to get its own Excel file. I've done that bit. I told you I would, and I promised I would, and I did. And look, corporate's got an Excel file. Executive general administration's got their own Excel file. Everyone gets their own Excel file. So they need to pull their actual data out of the, uh, out of the, out of the fabric lake house out of our data storage location our centralized awesome data place so it's going to go out of the out of the um erp system into fabric out of fabric into excel we're going to forecast it we're going to save that forecast we're going to then pull the forecast back into fabric so that we can use the forecast for the next stage which will be the consolidated uh forecast and calculation because, and so we have to do a consolidated forecast. So that's the second piece. Um, so there's a slight change here. I know what I said originally was that we would consolidate first here and then do a forecast um, for all countries, but we actually, each country is going to do their own forecast. So this is going to be country by country. So there's a slight change. It's still the same flow, but um, yeah, so this is going to be a country by country forecast. And we're going to do our KPI calculation, all that stuff. I might swap these around because I want to potentially forecast our EBIT. Should I forecast our EBIT? I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Tell me, accounting people, tell me, am I, do you forecast your EBIT or do you just calculate your forecast? You probably just do all your forecasts and then you calculate your EBIT off those forecasts. So yeah, you do kind of forecast your EBIT. That makes sense to me. Uh, Richard missed the previous event, so hopefully Shelley's put some uh, logs, blogs, things in. Oh, there's Medallion Architecture. Hey, can you link the YouTube channel as well, Shelley? Because 
Uh, Richard might need it to see the previous episodes. Um, all right, so we're going to, okay, we're going to do forecast in EBIT, you, you know, this kind of section. Okay, so what we're going to do today is I want to do this bit. So we're basically starting from the actual bit where we're actually building something now. I've spoken a lot of theoretically up to now, but now we're actually going to build stuff. Today I want to try and do this bit, the ERP import from the CSV files into Fabric. And I want to do this bit, and I want to do this bit. And I don't think I'll get them all done, because there's a lot to do. So these are the three areas we want to do today. We're going to pull data out of our ERP system. We're going to bring it into Fabric. We're going to create tables. We're going to then open our Excel spreadsheets. We're going to bring that data back in. I've already said it. Hopefully, it makes sense. If you've got any questions, let me know. Richard knows with an alien architect, of course. He's a data guy. All right. Um, that's the meetup. I'm, I presume you've seen that because you okay, we made it to here. All right. So what are we doing? We have a lake house. Inside that lake house, we have Aardvark Finance Bronze. We're in our development workspace. The workspace is synced via GitHub to our um to our Git repository, which means our data flows don't sync, but everything else does. Uh, we're going to use data flows a lot because I'm a data flow because I'm a Power Query guy. I love Power Query. Um, data flows aren't the most efficient thing in the whole world, but you know it's just one of those things. So the first challenge for us today is take the CSV files. So we're pretending that we've already got the CSV files ready to go in our ERP extracts folder here in the files area of our lake house. So however that might happen, you know that's a whole process you'll need to figure out. But we've got our ERP extracts and CSV files, so let's turn them into lake house uh, tables. All right, create and lake house tables. Um, let's call this. We'll create a new data flow. Well, let's go into data engineering mode first. That's the first thing. Down here in the bottom left, we got our 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 little changer. We go to data engineering mode because that's what we're doing right now. And we want to create a new, let's, should we use a data pipeline to bring the CSV files in? Hmm. I feel like that's the most appropriate solution. We'll do it for now and then we'll see if we can do it in data pipeline. I'm going to call this uh, ingest uh, ERP data. So when do you use a pipeline? When do you use a data flow? When do you use a notebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? The way that I kind of think about it is that I use a pipeline for all ingest from third-party systems kind of scenarios because pipelines are theoretically the most efficient uh, at bulk ingest of data. Um, and then I might turn this pipeline into like something else. Like I might use a notebook within the pipeline instead of using the copy data assistant or whatever um, to make it more uh, efficient. But we'll worry about all that later. So I'm not trying to build for efficiency here. I'm just trying to build something that works. The biggest mistake you can make, I reckon, when you're trying to do this stuff is try to get too fancy with efficiency. First, let's make it work. Then we'll make it efficient. The downside of this is that sometimes you build something that works and then everyone's like, put that in production and you never get an opportunity to go back. So, you know, you have to be a little, little practical about this stuff. We're just going to use a copy data assistant. I'm not going to do anything too fancy. So the first thing we have to do in our copy data assistant is select our data source. Choose the data source. Um, we can choose from a bunch of different possible sources. Now, our sources are a bit more limited in the pipeline than they would be in um, than they would be in say data flows. Data flows is more flexible. Flexible uh, data data pipelines are less flexible, but they're more bulk. But I think we can grab files. Can I pull from a let's say one like data hub? Uh, Aardvark Finance Bronze in Aardvark Finance Dev. 
have to be careful that I chose the right thing. So, oh, oh, click the wrong button. Um, notice I've got multiple lake houses here with the same name, and that's because I I uh, I branched out into a different workspace. So you got to be careful here, right? Make sure you choose the right one. This is the right one, I think. Oh, oh something bad has happened. Okay, we're back. Oh, that was a data destination. Wait, I'm. Wait, wait, wait. It's going away. On here. Okay, choose data source. Connect. Oh, okay. Files. Hopefully, our files will appear. I don't know if Teams is making it slower than it normally is or if it's always this slow. That's pretty slow though. Okay, so in our ERP extracts folder, so this is just, we connected to our bronze lake house. This is the same, it's the same as this folder here. All right, you can see it's our bronze lake house. Okay, and so that's where it lives. Uh, ERP extracts. I'm just going to bring in Australia for now. And then we'll worry about bringing stuff. Actually, I could probably just select the folder and then it might just use a thing to combine it all together. I don't know. It does say select a folder or file. So that makes me think that I can do that. So that's maybe what I'll do. Um, since these are all exactly the same format and they all have exactly the same file name, I am just going to select the folder and I'm going to hope for the best. Um, okay, while this is loading, I'm going to talk about how I'm cheating because I spoke about this last week, but I also, or whenever we last did this, um, I'm cheating because everything's really neat and tidy. Um, these, these have come from five different source systems, but they all have exactly the same structure, exactly the same name. All the columns are the same. This almost never happens in real life. In real life, you're going to have different systems. You're going to have different things associated with them. People are going to customize it. They're going to call something. This, this file name is going to be completely different to this one. All of these things, we're, we're bypassing all that stuff because that's just that's kind of just boring stuff you have to you have to just fix um but you will have to fix that in your processes if you don't if things aren't n n nicely lined up so i am cheating a little bit but you know there's only so much we can do okay it says it's comma delimited text which is correct uh puts in a row delimiter is the first row a header yes it is there's our first row um it looks like it's bringing in the correct organization name the department account type account code gl value and date so that looks good hit next now i'm going to choose a data destination so i'm going to i'm pulling it out of bronze because i'm pulling the csv but i'm creating a table in the lake house so this the um destination is going to be a table it's going to be a table we're going to create a new table that table is going to be called something we don't know that's going to ask us to map it this is exactly the same as like azure data factory copy data it's the same technology underlying it all um okay so we'll call this table what are we going to call it we're going to call it erp something or other it's a bronze what's our naming convention hey i'll need suggestions for this because i haven't thought about it what should our naming convention for our tables be inside our bronze lake house? It should have a source. So this will be, let's pretend our, what's our source, SAP? SAP underscore, uh, and then a name of the table that's being extracted, which is uh, general ledger. I'm gonna use snake case or lower case. General underscore ledger underscore. Maybe you would have dev test prod here. Maybe. I don't know. What else could we possibly put in this table name? I'll just call it SAP underscore general ledger for now. Uh, all because all. All of the organizations 
consolidated, or you can maybe call it cons. Uh, any suggestions for table names? No, no one's no one's got any ideas. All right, uh, then we do our mapping. Okay, so we have to say, okay, organization name is it a string? Yes. Department name is a string? Yes. Uh, account types a string. What are our possibilities? I mean, it's going to be a string, but I just want to see what's in here. It could be a boolean, a, a boolean, a byte, a short, a binary, a date, a timestamp, a decimal. Yeah, okay, so it's all pretty standard, simple data types. Uh, account type is string. Account code is string. I'm probably just letting you know. I'm probably just going to bring everything in as a string. Should I turn this into like a load or something? I think bring it in in the format that you get it for bronze to make life easier. Don't try and mess around too much with data types until further down. So bronze, the, the purpose of the bronze layer is to have a raw load of the data as you receive it. The purpose of the, and then take that and then standardize it, which means that you would potentially change the data types, right? And then once it's standardized and conformed to all the standards and all the rest of it, you move it into silver. So I think at this stage, we just want a raw extract. So even though date is a uh, obviously a date, I'm not going to change it to a date yet. I'm going to leave it as a string. Let me know what you think. Is that the right thing to do or not? Um, and then the other option is enable partitions. Um, partitioning is where you it separates the files out, like uh, if you've got very, very large files. If they were very, very large um, CSV files, let's say, and I'm talking very large, like gigs and gigs, then you potentially would partition them, say, by date or by some other thing to make the each of the individual files smaller to make reading and processing the files faster. That's what partitions do. Okay. Um, let's see what it says in the help. Create partitions in the folder structure based on one or multiple columns, each distinct Column will be a new partition, so you could make it on month or year or whatever. Yeah, so we don't, you could potentially um, partition by organization, for example, and then each of the organizations would get their own partition. I'm not going to bother with partitioning. I don't think it's enough data right now. Um, this only becomes a thing. If you're finding problems with um, with performance, um, with your either your, your query performance down the line, from here, then maybe you would start thinking about partitioning and how to make that more efficient. Uh, could get messy data and to avoid an error by keeping it as a string. That's exactly right. Yeah. So um, the reason why is that we we don't 100% know that somebody hasn't entered their email address in the date field right now. We want we, we potentially, you know, like it's coming from an ERP system, so I'm pretty confident, but we're also going to be bringing in Excel files, right? And people do crazy stuff in Excel files. And so right now, if we don't leave this as a string and we set this to a date and then this has an email address in it, then it breaks the pipeline. And we don't want to break the pipeline at this stage. We want it to just copy everything as it is and then we'll build uh, logic to help us understand um, uh, to clean up the file. All right. So after all of that talking and me going on, that was actually relatively simple. We chose a data source, some CSV files, and then we could just basically we're going to take it out of the lake house. We're going to put it back in the lake house into our bronze layer into a new table called SAP General Ledger. All save and run. Go. It's called copy EGA and it runs a pipeline, pipeline for us, which is nice. Uh, bring it in a string and process it later because it's easy to automate the process later. Yes. Uh, does partitioning help parallel processing in the cloud? Yes. So partitioning is going to help us with parallel because Spark like engines are going to try it like if you've got nicely partitioned data and there is an optimal number of files and this is something that if you follow um, MIM and uh, Phil Seamark like I was having a, a chat with them when they came over for the fabric uh, roadshow and they were talking about that failed we'll talk about that in a sec um, they, they're they're very interested in like optimizing the number of um, 
uh, that ha like how to what's the optimal file size and what performs better and all that stuff. Okay, why did this fail? So our, our activity failed. So we can use this little thing to hopefully help us find out. Invalid character in a column name. Well, that isn't surprising. Um, but also annoying that we have to do that. So now we have to fix this, uh, fix this guy. So let's go in here and edit it. How do I edit it? Why can't I just like, no, is it, it's already here. Right. Um, activated the source is tin mapping. Destination. Okay, so spaces in the font in the in the names. I don't know why it doesn't just throw an error here, but that's probably what it's complaining about. You can't have spaces. So we're you we're going into Delta Parquet format, and Delta Parquet format is like snake case style. It doesn't like any spaces or special. Also, it's spelt organization with a Z. So we'll fix that up. So that's what I'm going to assume. We'll try this and see if it works. And department name. This is my favorite part of doing data engineering is fixing, uh, fixing uh, column errors. Count type. <laughs> I don't even know why it suggests these. Like it should just, anyway, let me complain to Microsoft about that. Uh, and then I'll put everything else in lowercase just to make it all normalized and standardized. Snake case. All right. I hope that works. Run. Well, save and run. Uh, it would be great to have a wizard to auto fix those names. Is date possibly a reserve word? So, yeah, um, I don't think date's a reserve word. I hope not. Interesting thought. We'll see if we get a failure. Well, it's not, hasn't instantly failed. No, it has instantly failed. Now what? Mapping column name not found in source file. Ooh, do we have different column names? That could be interesting. <gasps> that says Germany centric. Says, see what I see here. Uh, I wonder if it's like a column name thing. Let's actually open them up. Have a look. See. This is what it looks like opened in but old Excel. Okay, so it's obviously like they all look fine. It seemed to load a few before it failed. It might be USA is the problem. USA is always the problem. Now, is there any change? Department name, account type, account code, account, geo account, fiscal year. If anyone's got any, oh, month number. Month. This says date and this says fiscal year month number. Well, there's your problem right there. You know how I said I was going to cheat and they're all got exactly the same month column names? I was wrong. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Uh, I might re extract Australia if the rest have the same. Let's have a look. Fiscal year month number in France, Germany. I can just check here. Fiscal year month number in Germany, 
fiscal year, month number in USA. So Australia is the problem, not the USA. Here I am blaming the USA, and it's not them after all. Um, that's so sad. All right. Well, I'll quickly just extract it again. Oh, okay, I'll have to find the... Uh, so um, I'm using Power BI Desktop to extract the data out to pretend like... Anyway, it's complicated. I'll fix that in a second. All the other countries are the problem to Stephen. That's right. It's not Australia. Uh, that's funny. Now you're not necessarily going to okay. So what are some other ideas for fix uh, for fixing fixing that right? So uh, Richard said, hey, you maybe could split split the data columns. Like, yeah, you might if you don't have power. This is you know what I'm talking about when you're talking about creating. I want all I want to do is create an income statement. Like that's all I'm trying to do. But you've given me this data and all of it's the same except one. What if I don't have access to this report? Like this, think about the rework that just happens just with these one one little mistake. Because if I'm just an analyst and I don't have access to the source system, then I got to go back to the people who do the source system, write a request, hey, can you redo the extract for Australia? Can you make sure these columns are right? Then they get it wrong and then we got to extract it again. And then blah, 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 blah. and like it just goes through this horrible back and forth system. So even though all your responsibility is creating this income statement report or some kind of cool interactive dashboard, you still need to have access to these source systems. You need to be able to have power over these things so that you can set these data extracts up correctly. Or you need to have direct access to the people that set these um, reports so that that can happen, right? And it's like every little piece of this um, matters. And this extract is only going to be used, like it's not even used in the final report. It's only used in the budget tool, which then the, the budget tool then does the forecast and then the forecast tool, you know, like it's three steps back. So anyway, little rant over. Um, or you could have a different load process for each file and use Silver to make them all compatible. That is very true, Shelley. I was trying to just consolidate a bunch of different things. We could create five separate um extracts and then consolidate which would be the other a, a proper way to conform right so should we do that maybe we should do that maybe we should do that so we'll only get australia and then we'll do that we'll worry about the rest later is that better practice hmm. what's the best practice five times as many five times as many scripts but more modular if if the script fails because canada didn't extract their data properly then everyone else's still works and we blame canada blame canada um let's have a look at this uh thing again it doesn't say okay so the reason why i like this idea and i'm sorry that i dwell on these things too much but i want to give you the best that we want to build this in the best possible way. Like we want to make sure that this is as good as it can be. So that's why I'm dwelling on it a bit. Um, oh, it is. In, so it tells me that it was the Canada problem, but actually it was the Australia problem because Australia was first. So it tells me which file here. So I'm 50-50 mm, on this. You can create a script or function and looping it through all the files in the folder. That's kind of what we're doing right now. That's effectively what it does. This copy data wizard creates a, it's just going to iterate through the files and run the same script over and over again. It's not really a script though. So it's like we could create individual pieces or we could create one consolidated piece. But if the consolidated piece, then everybody fails. If the individual pieces, then only Canada fails. Therefore, I'm going to say we should create individual ones and we'll just create them as these as copy data activities across the whole thing. All right, I've decided. <laughs> uh, so to to fix this, sorry, I shouldn't skip ahead. I know I get uh, I go too fast sometimes. To fix this, I'm going to fix the file path here. I'm going to fix which we're going to rename copy this copy uh, data thing to copy Australia, then copy Canada, then blah 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 blah. 
Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So general, if we call this copy underscore oz underscore ERP data. Change this name. Click on it so that I can see the source. I have the horrible feeling that my microphone stopped working. Richard, can you give me a thumbs up? Thanks. All right. Um, okay. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change the source to only select Australia, right? That's basically what I'm doing. And I do that here at the file path area. So I just want and then now it's put the file name in here. Okay. And now it should just work. It should just work because I've just selected Australia. And the table name is going to be now SAP General Lezard Oz because we're, we're creating um, a new table. Do I have to create the table first? I'm going to test to see what happens. We'll just see if, if just changing this is enough or whether I need to create the table. All right, uh, I've got to save. Save. Click the save button. Click the run button. No whammies, no whammies. It's being queued by the engine. Continues to be queued. It's in progress. Still in progress. Don't fail. Please work. Hooray! Succeeded. Powerful success. Um, all right, we did it. We brought in some data. Uh, it. Let's see what, what happened inside the lake house, and then we'll come back here. All right, so let's have a look at the lake house here. We click on here. This will open the lake house. This will show us our tables and stuff in here. We've got a table called OOC budget, which is something that I created last time. And see how I've got this unidentified? It takes a little while for it to like figure itself out. I think if we refresh, it'll probably come good. There it is. Oh, yes, OOC budget. That's right. I can probably delete this. We're not going to use it. Um, it created the SAP General Ledger All Table. Did it ingest any data in? No. So it must have created that table in the wizard. Yeah, so here's our data. So it created the table in the wizard when I said create a new table, but then I changed the name. I just typed a new name and it just automatically created a new table for me. I didn't need to explicitly tell it to create that table, which is kind of nice. Um, I'm going to delete this and I'm going to delete the, but this budget table because that was just an experiment. I want to keep things nice and clean. Here's our ERP extracts are still there. These are all the files that we, we're going to be ingesting. These ones are all empty right now. Um, we'll get to that later. All right. We did it. Let's do some more ingesting. So we've got it, this. We want to copy this, clone it. And now we're going to call this ERP Canada. And we'll have to change the mappings and we'll have to change the source and we'll have to change all the things. It says, yeah, copy Oz ERP. Oh, okay, I've got to fix the name. Canada. Selecting Canada, fixing the name because it says copy, copy. Save. Doesn't automatically run, right? No, cool. Okay, the source is Canada. The destination is a new table called Canada. The mapping is different because so we can say import schemas. Will that work? What I'm hoping that this will go and read the CSV file for Canada now from the source. I'm hoping.
Uh, if one file fails, it will not store data for successful files. Uh, so we'll talk about how we're going to run these in parallel and then what to do on failure. That's what all these little guys will help us do, I think. Okay, so it got it did, it worked. So it got the correct um it's got the new the new um the new schema. But we've got this that old problem where these are wrong. So we're gonna write these in snake case. And I also change it to an S, I remember. Because I'm Australian. Organization name, department underscore name, account underscore type, account underscore code. I'm sure I've seen a version of the wizard that did actually tell me to fix these um, these names before I got to it. I'm sure I've done that when we've done this in the past. Amount plus va uh, underscore value. Value. Fiscal. What's everybody's favorite case for table names? I'll give you your, uh, I'll give you your choices. Let's open notepad. Snake. Oh my God, I can't type. Snake underscore case. Camel. Case. Uh, Pascal. Case. Um, all in one word case. <laughs> what are the others? Any others? Anyone use anything different from that? Snake, 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 couple of snakes. Shouldn't you be appending medallion level in there too? I'm not sure I understand that. Sorry, Shelley. Oh, like bronze, maybe, yeah. yeah. You mean I should put bronze in the copy data thing? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you might be right. Lots of snake cases for, okay, good work. No camel case, I like camel case. Use that for variable names when you're programming, eh? All right, anyway, sorry, I digress. I have a bad habit of doing that. We'll never get this thing done. Uh, month, no. That looks right. Mapping is correct. Intelligent throughput optimization is set to auto. Um, the time at is 12 seconds. It's getting Canada. The destination is the correct table name. We have all snake case in our thing, including the S in organization. Everything is spelt correctly. There's no errors. It's just going to work first time. Here's a question that I've never thought about. Can I just run this one? Anyone who knows how to actually use this tool properly, can you tell me whether I can just run one at a time? Or do I have to trigger them both? I'm just going to run them for now. Surely I can run just one though. On success, on fail, on completion, on skip. Mm -hmm. If this is a data flow gen two, I have not found a way to uh, only do one part of the uh, load or I'm usually doing it in. Okay, just query. run one at a time. Yeah. Well, I think we'll do on completion and then we'll just run them like this in pattern. In... So this one will complete, then this one will run, then this one. So we should we run them in in parallel or should we run them in series? Anybody got any um, thoughts about that? If they run in series, subsequent ones won't happen if the first one fails. No, that's only if we say on success. This one is going to run regardless of whether it uh, works or not. That's why we use on completion. This is the cool thing about this. We can talk about these little arrows. So um, this is this is uh, data pipelines. So you've got on skip. So if it gets skipped over, then do the next one, right? On complete on success, only run this next one if the first one is successful. Uh, on failure, only run this step if something bad happens. And then this one is on completion. This is run this step regardless of what happens to this one. So what does that mean? It means you can do this. You can run it, create an activity that is like uh, 
can we run like some kind of power automate activity? Probably, because why wouldn't we be able to? A notification to Teams. Oh, yes. And then on failure, tell my team, and the team is going to be uh, Aardvark uh, Data Engineers or whatever. Data folks. This is probably a real team, so I might have to put it in a real team here. Um, sign into Teams. Okay. Hopefully this doesn't reveal anything revealing. Should be fine. Pop up blocked. Try again. It's just going to say, oh, there it goes. We move that over here away from prying eyes. I'm about to allow access to teams. This is what it's, uh, I don't, I think I can show you this i'm going to show you like this uh, it says you're going to provide access to teams that's all it says okay and i said allow and then i'm signed in and then if i give it a real team name like a genuine bona fide team name let me uh, try what's well, a good team for me to put this into DWC reporting analytics team, that'll do. Right, so if I call this DWC reporting I'm going to click learn more. I, I don't know about how this works, but I want to learn. Automate send up with Data Factory. Yep. Okay, grant consent. That's what we did. We logged in. You need to allow access. That's what we did. On success, send an email. I don't want to send an email. I want to do Teams. Share to Teams. I know. First pipeline. Add data flow. Add a data flow to send a notification. Doesn't say anything about Teams. Okay. Well, we'll just have to hope that this is right. Oh, post in. Oh, here it is. Channel. In this team. Okay. EWC reporting analytics. Channel is general. Okay. I thought it would be this easy. General. Enter some text. Something is broken. Borken. Australia file didn't load. Subject, help -o. Okay. So that's going to be, that's going to be it on failure, but also on success. No, I can't do both. Oh, no, I can. Awesome. So no matter what happens, we're going to get a notification in Teams. Okay, this is fun. Run. Save and run. This is the team. Wait, let me check if there's anything on there. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so that's in progress right now. Excitement plus. Oh, look. Yo, something is borken. A stray file didn't load. I got a notification. And then all my team are going to be like, what is this notification? <laughs> all right. And so that works. That's cool. So that's how you orchestrate uh, notifications for things. So this is what when we're building, when we're being serious data professionals.
um, we want to have like notifications, right? When things don't work. Um, and so that's how you do that, which we should, we, we, we will build in because we need a notification or you could run something that maybe automatically fixes this, or you could run something that, you know, tells the CEO not to, not to, uh, tweet or whatever. Um, you can add system variables to the messages. You can do lots of that. Yeah. All right. So that's running in serial with notifications if we wanted to do it that way. Uh, the other way we could do it is to run it in parallel. If we run it in parallel, then we just remove this, I think. Can I just can I just delete this? How do I can I drag it away? No, can I delete? Oh, you hit the delete key. Hit the delete key. So if we run them like this, they'll run in parallel. because they just both start at the same time. And then we could like have this notification, just like whatever, and then system like have a have a variable, right? That'd be cool, which is like this one's Canada, this one's Australia. And then you could have in your notification whether it ran or not in your, in your thing. Surely you could do that kind of thing, right? That's the sort of thing we really want to be able to do. Oh, look at this, add dynamic content. See, I knew it. You could put in the workspace ID, you could put in the activity outputs. So if I create a parameter, uh, yeah, new parameter, name, uh, file, name is a string, and this is Canada. I don't know, I'm guessing that this is what we do. And then what we should be able to do here is add dynamic content, variables, file name. Look at that, just like that, it's too easy. Being a data engineer is easy, all right. Um, so we created some things. We're gonna do the other five now. Uh, I noticed someone said, hey, why don't you just do Australia and then the rest of the world since they're all the same? Well, why don't we just protect against the, this problem happening again, just in case USA changed their format, or we'll just bring them in individually is what I'm thinking. Okay, but I'll, I can just duplicate this one because this is the one that's got the right format. I don't need to remap it. Um, so that's what we're going to do. One, two. Maybe they should run in just so I can see them all on the same page. One, two, three, four, one more. Copy, 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 copy. Yeah, nice. Okay, copy. And then this is going to be France. Rah. Get rid of all the other copies. That's going to be France. This one's going to be USA. This is going to be Germany. Germany. Okay. Canada's correct. So USA, we've got our source to USA. Set the source to USA, hit OK. Set the destination to USA. USA. Mapping should be correct, so I'm going to hope that that's correct. And that's all good to go. That is USA done. This is Germany. Germany, we're going to sub browse. We're going to get the Germany extraction. We're going to set the destination to Germany. And mapping should be correct. Source is correct. Destination is correct. Mapping is correct. Happy days. Now France. Oh, I should. Yeah, that's Germany. Okay, so this is copy France. Source is the France file. Destination is the new France table. Oops, clicked off it. Destination is the France table. Source is the France file. Mapping is correct. Settings are all default. And save. Um, and run. Dun, 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 so now it's running them all in parallel. It'll be interesting to see. I've got an F64 going because I'm still on the trial. 
So it'll be interesting to see how long it takes just to ingest. It's not very big, not very, not a lot of file, not a lot of data. It shouldn't take long. Not a lot of data. Uh, and file location. How much data you ask, Greg? How much data is it? Very small amount. 33K, 125K, 167K, nothing. It's nothing. And they ran in 30 seconds total. It's because they ran in parallel. So our maps our maximum, 34 seconds. Took 30 seconds to ingest. Um, how does that compare to doing it another way? I don't know. It's probably... The thing about this is this will scale much better. If these were a, a gigabyte each or whatever, it'll still run pretty quickly, I think. I'm pretty sure. All right. We should now, in our wonderful uh, lake house, we should have multiple tables available to us. They didn't fail, did they? Here's the unidentified appears again. This unidentified, it um, yeah, it's like it doesn't load the table name for a little while after you create it. It's really weird. You just got to keep refreshing and then see if they all appear. It's amazing. We have loaded the data. Well done, everybody. We made it. France, Australia, Canada, Germany, USA, all separately loaded into their own super separate tables. Everything's beautiful. Um, we need to do some standardization to this before and then load it to silver. Or should we standardize it and leave it in bronze? Can actually, I want to, I had a conversation with my data engineering team about this and I don't think we came to a conclusion. So let's, as a community, all decide right now this is going to be the last thing for the day because we've run out of time. Okay, I've got data. Here it is. It's awesome. Let's use our Australia and Canada as our example. Oz, Canada. They're slightly different, exactly the same as our um, as our example, and we load them into bronze. bronze in their raw format and then let me tell you let me talk to you about all the different things that you do you do standardize standardize conform and then you do uh, enrichment you do security. Um, so that's like um, not making it, you know, like uh, PPI, that kind of stuff. Well, that's part of conformance. So maybe security is part of conformance. But anyway, we'll, we can talk about that in a sec. And then you do dim layer. We'll just call it dim layer. Slash semantic layer, which is the correct name semantic semantic is it spelt the same as the company name semantic semantic layer dim layer okay so that's okay so if data comes into bronze then that's raw so we have our raw layer right let me go back to my pencil so this is raw here now I want to standardize and conform it. In other words, I want to make these columns, the date column. In this case, I need to turn the date column into month and year. And then and then bring all these other tables, which already have year and month already, into a single table. That's consolidating it, conforming it, standardizing it. But I'm not doing any, I'm not adding any any enrichment at this stage. Do I move it into silver? And I'll give you another example. Let's say we're changing the date. Uh, we have to look at this one. Let's say this date format, we we had a standard date format that we changed, which is, you know, like, um, what's our favorite, Shelley? Backwards year, 
month day. Uh, did you have a name for that last time? Semantic. Is it Semantic with an I? And Semantic is the name of the company. Um, well, I've been spelling it wrong this whole time. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Semantic. Semantic. Okay, so someone's put a picture. Hang on, let me bring the picture over. Okay, so this is a better picture than me drawing. Okay, so you've got data coming in, and then you've got Braw, and you do raw integration, and then this is filtered, cleaned, and augmented data goes into silver, and then business level aggregates go into gold, right? So this is kind of my understanding of it, I think. And then, um, so at some point, at some point, you with those two, those two, these two pieces here. So let's say you go, you do standardize and conform, and then you do enrichment and security. So let's say you add columns, right? You add extra columns, but you haven't built the semantic layer yet. This is the gold layer here. So my th my understanding was you go raw into bronze. As soon as you standardize it, it goes into silver. As then you add columns and stuff that also goes back into silver. And then it goes into gold. So it goes B, S, S, G, right? Now, one of my data engineers said, no, 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 no. You go raw into bronze, standardize and conform goes back into bronze. Then enrichment goes into silver. And then semantic layer is gold. Cast your votes, people. What should you do? Do you double handle in bronze or do you double handle in silver? Is really my question, I guess. I don't know what my question is. Uh, thanks for the picture. I'm assuming that was Shelley. Uh, can the input files be kept in folders in one's own laptop or do we need something else like a gateway to get the data ingestion? Oh, so these input files in um, uh, for this, this guy. So this is using... Um, a little tool called one lake it's it's like OneDrive, except it's one lake it's the one drake one lake data sync right and so in this case yeah i could just like have this on my laptop as long as i and it's synced to my one lake and then i just copy the data this acts as if i'm um, just doing it on my own laptop but it's syncing it to the cloud exactly the same way as it does in OneDrive. so you could set up your users that way I'm probably a little circumspect about whether you should do that because if you set up one like data sync, like you get access to like this, this is like the actual Delta files and stuff. So I don't know if that's the best solution, um, but you don't need a data gateway in that case because the sync is taking care of it. And and if you want to, uh, the technical, it's a HTTPS um, uh, one way, uh, sync. So, so the person's laptop um, creates an outbound connection to Fabric use over HTTPS, and it sends the files that way. So, Fabric doesn't connect this way into the person's laptop. That's something that sometimes people think about. So, it's an outbound outbound sync type scenario. Um, if you were to say here in our lovely pipeline, if you wanted to go and get the data from on-premises somewhere, from a from a SQL server on-premises, you would need a gateway. You would need a gateway installed somewhere locally that you could go and get that data from, right? And that creates this same connection, this HTTPS outbound connection. So this connects to the SQL server, and then it creates the outbound connection to Fabric on your behalf. And that's, and that's, and that's called an integration runtime or a gateway, depending if you're using um, Fabric or if you're using Synapse, like they're both the same thing though, basically. So the Power BI data gateway, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Azure Synapse Analytics integration runtime, it's all basically the same thing. It's just a thing that connects locally that sends it out. So you only need that if you want to do this cop, if you wanted to do that sync here uh, in your, in your data pipelines, but in our case, we're just going to, we're just copying the file locally and then the sync is taking care of you and putting it up into the cloud. I hope that makes sense. 
Uh, change is a part of the move into silver. Yeah, that's what I reckon too. Okay, who? what did other people say? Uh, in Azure Training, it said keep as raw in bronze. Yeah. Uh, don't use bronze, silver, and gold labels. Yeah. Well, that's a whole, I, I like this be, this should be raw and this should be standardized and this should be enriched and this should be, you know, anyway, we'll talk about that. There's a big, you should have seen like, I can't talk to you about much that happened over in Seattle with, at the MVP summit because all of it is under NDA. But I will tell you that the conversation about bronze, silver, gold versus standardized, conformed, enriched was hilarious hilarious there's two camps and they're very passionate <laughs> anyway uh so that's good times uh maybe semantic models shouldn't be considered a part of the gold layer they build based on the gold yeah i know sorry I, I call this the semantic layer i didn't call this a semantic model because for that particular reason right um it's not it's not a semantic model the semantic model happens later this is a semantic model that gets built here but we call this like a i call this a semantic layer because it's got all because the dims and facts get created here like it, gold does create that's what the kind of purpose of gold is that's the way that i kind of think about it that that's not a semantic model here that's just a set of tables that are dims and facts and then we create the semantic model past that anyway that's my thinking Woof. All right, man. See, we always end up with me scribbling on a whiteboard, getting distracted. But we did do, we achieved something for once. We actually got, um, we got some data ingested. We probably didn't get as much done as we would have liked, but that's okay. You know, like we're learning, we're learning. It's lunch and learn. It's not lunch and be an expert. It's lunch and learn. Um, that's it. We have to stop. Lunch is over. Sorry, folks. Um, but I hope you have a great weekend. Like I said, next week I'm gonna I have to change the meetup. It's gonna be like an hour earlier because I've got I've got an actual lunch. I've got a real lunch that I have to go to. Um, might be half an hour earlier. I don't think it needs to be too much earlier. Um, but I will need to make it a little bit earlier next week. So be ready. It's gonna be like eleven o'clock, not twelve o'clock. Um, if you uh, want to uh, come back next week, we would love to have you. Uh, but I want to say thanks to you for coming along this week, and we'll see you soon. And uh, if you want to hang around and have a chat to me, um, I'll hang around. Lunch and morning tea, that's right. It's brunch and, brunch and learn, I might call it. Um, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll catch up soon. Have a great weekend, and, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks, folks. All right.